Okay, so I want to thank everybody for joining us this afternoon on um, December 17th. It's a very big day for us. It's a closeout for our keynote series at the store. Um, we've been doing a lot more with expanding with graphic novels and comics. And um, closing out this year, we're very, very, very excited to bring in the one, the only, Brian K. Vaughn to our store keynote. Thank you for hanging out. Let me make sure this is Hi, Mr. Vaughn. Okay. Call me Brian. <laughs> So, um, but what is your favorite thing that you like doing? Is it working in television or is it working in comics? And no, I, I like working in comics so much more than film and television. And this year was kind of me realizing, like, I'm just going to take a break from the Hollywood nonsense. Like, it's an honor to get to work there, but I'm really, I'm so much happier getting to work in comics. Wow. So, at this point in time, then, with, with um, Under the Dome, is that something that you're still going forward with? Or? No, actually, uh, I stepped away from uh, Under the Dome at the beginning of the second season. It was Stephen King is one of my heroes, and it was pretty amazing to get to help him bring one of his books to the small screen. But I think after the first season, I, I just realized, you know, I, I'm always at my happiest making new stuff. And it's fun to get to, you know, sort of help another writer bring his story to life. But I'd rather do new things. So, yeah, it's all comics all the time. Right now. Wow. So there's no there's no foreseeable things going on in television <clears throat> media after... I mean, it, it breaks my agent's heart. So they always call them and like, please take some work so we can get paid too. So things come up. But uh, for right now, no, it just comes. I don't know if you guys know about it. He has a website with Marcus Martin. It's called Panel Syndicate. And um, he has what's called a private eye. It's a straight to digital. You have to download it. And it's pay whatever you wish. What, yeah. what was the idea of, to allow no price point outside of point zero zero yeah. to allow customers to purchase? Yeah, uh, Marcos, who's the artist, is mentally ill. And it was his idea. He, and I was like, this is a terrible idea. <laughs> Because uh, I remember when you know Radiohead did that with an album they put on, you could pay whatever you want. I was like, I don't think they ever did it again. Right. Yeah. Like, we're, we're not Radiohead. Yeah. Everybody says they made a lot of money but lost a lot of money. Yeah. Doing so that. I was like, let's not do this. But Marcos is, uh, like I say, crazy and a bit of a socialist too. So he said, yeah, let's just, we'll put this out. And he said comics used to be a very inexpensive medium for everyone. And over the years, it's become a, a really expensive hobby for just a few people. And he said, maybe we can use the internet to turn that on its head. So yeah, so if you go to panelsyndicate.com, we now have nine issues out, and the 10th and final installment's about to come out. And you can pay whatever you want. You can uh, give us zero dollars, you can give us a dollar, you can throw us $60 if you're the wealthy heiress, I guess, or something. But uh, yeah, so it's uh, we're really proud of it. It's a story about... Uh, in the not too distant future, uh, the cloud bursts and sort of all of our worst secrets, every email you've sent about your boss, every late night drunken text, all of your Uber rides come spilling out. And, uh, and after that happens, America becomes obsessed with privacy again and suddenly we all have secret identities. So in this future, whenever anyone leaves the house, they put on a mask, they have different masks for different parts of their life. So. Yeah, when we started this, it was kind of before the Edward Snowden of it all, or uh, you know, this recent Sony hack. And we thought it was just a crazy, far out fable, but it seems to be becoming true. Was that something that you actually thought about whenever when you started writing this, or was this Marcos's idea initially, and then you flushed that? No, I, I guess this was an idea I had because I'm uh, scared of the internet. I'm not on Twitter or <laughs> Facebook, or I just think. Uh, uh, writers in particular should be very private, which I'm saying into a microphone as I'm leaving the house. But, uh, I'm a big liar, but uh, for the most part, I like to just be a, a hermit and just connect with people in real life, not online. So w w when you when you're writing something like you know the Private Eye and also with Saga, uh, is this something where you're 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 focusing more on the human nature of how people interact with each other, as opposed to people who are just constantly being the type of person who you see that is uh, exposed all the time. Because I noticed that with Saga, it's very internal. The characters' motivations are there, you can see it right there based on what they're doing and, and, and what their intentions are. It's different compared to other comics. Is, is that something that you put into your work in general? 
Well, I think it, comics have always just been a cheap form of therapy for me, and just whatever. Um, Why the Last Man was after a, a bad breakup where I got dumped, and suddenly the other sex was terrifying and confusing, and <laughs> Ex Machina was about being in New York after 9-11, and Saga is about me becoming a dad, so it is always just me trying to work out my problems and trick you guys into paying for it. So, <laughs> thank you. For those of you who haven't read Saga yet, it's uh, narrated... Uh, by the baby, who's sort of a, she starts out as a baby at the beginning of the book, but it's narrated from some part in the future. And I think when we started it, people were like, well, you know, there, there's no element of surprise. We know at least that Hazel's going to be okay, so there's really no kind of drama. And so Fiona or, and I wanted to prove that there can be, I think, and Hazel is sort of a very mean spirited narrator where she will drop things that will ruin your day or suggest things <laughs> that might not happen for a long time. But yeah, so even though we know Hazel is going to be okay, there's no guarantee that her parents will be okay, that her loved ones, you know, that the people chasing her, so. There are plenty of surprises to come. Um, one thing I noticed is how you mentioned in interviews before actually Saga started out that it was the idea behind it was more like Star Wars meets Romeo and Juliet in some fashion. Um, and then seeing how a lot of things have happened based on his narration, it was, I mean, you can't give too much away, but the end game, do we see characters in the future in their own way, kind of like how Star Wars has now in episodes? you know, seven, eight, and nine going on right now. Do we see that going on with Hazel at some point where we see her as an adult taking more of the protagonist role in the book? Definitely, without spoiling too much, this is Hazel's story. And, uh, you know, so it started out with, I think, a lot of people comparing it to Romeo and Juliet because of the parents, but in my mind, the parents are just supporting characters, that this is the story of uh, one girl. And yeah, so uh, I started it right when my daughter was born, and she's three now, and I kind of like that Hazel is growing up with her, and I'm sort of writing my experiences of her growing up, so, uh, you know, I, I hope to keep doing the book until my daughter's in her 80s, you know? Uh, <laughs> so, we'll see. Um, one thing that also came to mind for me was, um, in reading Saga, you have a lot of side characters who, as you mentioned, you know, Marco and, uh, and Alana are more the supporting characters in that sense, but you have all these other amazing supporting characters going on. Um, a lot of people were very frustrated with the idea of Lion Cat possibly dying, and then, um, and then a lot of people thought the Will was going to actually die when he got stabbed up. Um, do these characters help build out the, the story in a, in a in an epic fashion that you're looking to do is in the relation to how you see Star Wars being related to the comic in itself. Yeah, you know, I, I always wanted to do Star Wars is a, a great, uh, important work to me, but it's definitely, it's a story about good versus evil. And, uh, you know, I think life is obviously more complicated than a story. It's rarely good versus evil. And so I wanted to do a story where you would come to care about the quote unquote bad guys as much as you did the, the good guys. And that, uh, uh, yeah, so it's interesting to see people heartbroken about, you know, these murderers. And, like, they're trying to kill our heroes. Why are you cheering for them? And the, but and the, the thing I also know is that a lot of the bad guys are still people you can actually support in some fashion. I mean, I'm sure a lot of people here would say Prince Robot IV is not somebody you want to support. But yet, they don't want to see him actually go off the deep end more, you know, further than he's actually gone. Is it, is it that you choose to make characters more of a gray area? I mean, yeah, I don't think there is. We all live in gray areas, and I don't think anyone thinks of themselves as the villain of their own story. They always think that I'm the hero and I'm doing these things for heroic reasons. So, yeah, I just want to treat everyone as a, a three-dimensional, fully rounded person, even if they're a robot with a TV for a head. What was it that got you into comics, though, in general? What, you know, I, I've heard that, you know, Peter Davies your favorite writer, but, you know, what was it in, that started you off? Well, I realized, uh, I don't know, do, do parents still do this? When I was ever homesick from school as a little kid, my parents would bring me comics from yeah. a drugstore, yeah. I guess. Not that I, they sell comics at the drugstore anymore. Yeah. <laughs> but so, uh, and part of me wonders, is it because I was exposed to this thing when I was like in a fevered, sickly state as a child that it like it dug deeper into my brain? So what was that comic that you read? Uh, it was a, a random issue of The Amazing Spider-Man. And I guess I thought that it was uh, like an activity book that you were supposed to, that the panels, you would like cut out and you could arrange them in your own. So, you know, there's some picture of me 
uh, cutting up an Amazing Spider-Man like 16 or something. It's probably worth thousands of dollars, and I'm taping it next to pictures of Garfield. Or, uh, but from the very beginning, I wanted to get into comics and start to use them to make my own stories. So. When I was little, it was Spider-Man, but when I was 12, I read Watchmen, and that's I was off to the races. That's when I knew I want to be a writer, and uh, I want to work in comics, and wow. yeah, that's really So, what other writers other than Alan Moore? I mean, Alan Moore is the uh, big one, but uh, Garth Ennis is uh, one of my heroes, and uh, I think I just I've learned so much from his writing. It's very cinematic and pared down, and he really lets the artist tell the story. So, he's another huge influence. Um, one thing I, I remember years ago when I used to troll the internet looking at Warren Ellis' bad form, you know, used, used to be a constant presence on there, presence there with the early Matt Fraction and Kelly Sue yeah, and all yeah. that time. Uh -huh. um, and what was it about that time where you felt like it's much different now compared to like the, the effort that you need to get your name out there? Because back then, a lot of guys on that forum were, were really just starting out and a lot of people were work really hard as far as like getting the actual attention and, and the pushes and, and, and the advertising. But it's changed about a lot right now. How do you feel it's changed from that era, which is basically the early 2000s of which is now, which is a short time? Yeah, I mean, the, the internet changed everything. When I started, you know, I, I didn't even have an email address when I started writing comics, and it was, uh, it was much harder. And when you wanted to create comics, I would have to go to Kinko's, you know, and print <laughs> up things, and staple them myself, and take them to stores and ask them to take them on consignment. And I think now, if you want to make comics, you can make comics. Like when Marcos and I do the Private Eye and Panel Syndicate, we do, it's the two of us. We do it, I write it, he colors it, and we just throw it up online, and anyone can do that now. Right. So if you have a Tumblr account, right. you can be a comics professional. That's all it takes. So it really has even the playing field significantly. And you talk about doing new work. And it's very interesting how, you know, because a lot of people know more of you right now, but you've been doing this for like nearly 15 years or so. Yeah. Um, so what is it about now that makes you strictly want to do new work? Because at this point in your, in, in, your, in your career, I'm sure DC and Marvel are constantly knocking on your door when it was easier to get work from you back then. So what is it about now that makes you only wish to do new work? Yeah. Um you know, there are like highfalutin artistic reasons that I like to uh, create and the world needs okay, new okay. things. It's okay but to explain the highfalutin part. Uh, but uh, frankly, I just, I, I suck at writing the other characters. It's like I've always had a hard time writing characters that are not my own. Uh, that I found it just, uh, you know, it's really hard to plug myself into it. Really? And, uh, yeah, and it's, uh, I, I really, it's I mean, much fun. Not to do it too much because, like, I really enjoy this says a lot about me, though. I really enjoyed your Ultimate X-Men. Oh, thank you. You know, like, hey, 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 you know, one other Ultimate yeah, X-Men. Yeah, you know, thank I mean, you. it was it was basically between you and, and Bendis at the time, doing uh -huh. it. but you know, I remember when you know, and maybe I have my information wrong, but you were supposed to only do it for a brief time because at the time Brian Singer was supposed to do a short run himself. Right. Yeah, I forgot about that. And then you ended up doing quite a few issues. Yeah. Um, thought you did a great job. Thank you. So, what is it that you thought? didn't work for you to do these types of licensed characters in general. Yeah, I mean, it's hard, particularly with the X-Men and the Ultimate X-Men, was something where, you know, you were taking these characters and you wanted to do something new with them. Right. And it's hard, because I think readers, if you do something too new, they're like, uh, this is not who the character is. Right. And if you do something that's too old-fashioned, I think they hate that as well. Right. I just... Um, yeah, it, it's fun, it's yeah. great, and you get to work with amazing artists when you do right. superhero stuff at Marvel and DC, but I get to work with amazing artists now, so, you know, I loved Stan Lee growing up, he was one of my heroes, and I've always said I like Stan Lee, because when he was making comics, he didn't say, oh, I've got this great Green Lantern story that I've wanted to do my whole life, or I've got this Superman take that people are going to love, he said, you know, we need new things out right. there, so uh, we need more Stan Lees.